So it is very hard to believe, but almost 21 years ago, Nintendo released the iconic Nintendo GameCube device, which of course has that unique shape that it is literally a cube that can play games, and it has that handle that nobody knows why it was there. I guess if you were taking it to a friend's house, it makes it easier to carry. And of course, we also have the Game Boy Player underneath, which allows us to play classic Game Boy games on the TV screen, which I was very much a fan of. This console represents to me my prime era of gaming as it was the first one that I got that I was grown up enough to already be a cemented hardcore gamer and wow some of the titles that released in this era of gaming were incredible and in today's video I want to walk down memory lane together boot up some of my favorite GameCube games that I feel like we need to have brought back in the modern era and have a discussion on whether or not we can ever expect GameCube to be a part of something like Nintendo Switch Online. What's up, Nation? If it's your first time on the channel, make sure you join Sunbro Nation by subscribing below. Hit the like button on this video if you enjoy it today, and make sure you turn on your bell notification icon so you're kept up to date with all the newest gaming news. Now, guys, I am hyped to make today's video because if you know anything about me and you've been around on the channel for a while, you will know that I'm a sucker for nostalgia. The GameCube is arguably, in my opinion, the most nostalgic console for me because I was at that age where I was already cemented as a hardcore gamer, and the library of games that released on this thing is like completely mind blowing in hindsight. And that's the reason you see games skyrocket in price because people realized it. it didn't seem that popular at the time. But when you look back in history, you realize this is one of Nintendo's most fire consoles they ever put out. Even just having a startup screen doesn't seem like a big deal in and of itself. But I mean, just having that iconic you get the icon going, you get the classic GameCube logo, and then you get a actual uh, somewhat of a HUD, I guess you could say, or just a menu system where it's not much going on. It's a calendar with the time, it's options to change your sound from stereo to mono, or you can actually do your screen position and change that around. You can see what game you have in there, and then you can check your memory card, which unfortunately, my memory card seems to have, uh, the one that I have is not my primary files that I used to, I need to find it basically, long story short, but I'm a little bit upset about that. I went searching through everywhere that I knew to look and I can't find it. So hopefully I didn't lose all my save data, but this was a big deal at the time. And it was also, you know, it came along with one of what I would consider my favorite controller, Nintendo controller ever. Granted, I do enjoy the pro controller. Don't get me wrong, but this GameCube button layout to this day, I think I enjoy gripping and holding this controller more than anything else. It was so iconic that even with the different releases of the Super Smash Bros uh, iterations of games, of course, mainly being spawned by Melee, this one where I honestly put the majority of my hours into Smash still to this day. I've played Ultimate a ton. This one still takes the cake as far as how many total hours I've spent in the game. And it's one of those things that it created such a hardcore fan base and player base that people did not want to switch up the controls whenever it went to the Wii. And of course, we had uh, Smash Bros. Brawl. Well, you still had the GameCube ports that you could just use your same controller on on the Wii. Then on the Wii U, we got re-released GameCube controllers and even an adapter to let you use GameCube controllers. And again, with the Switch, the same treatment was given just because of how hardcore fans were around the button layout for GameCube controller and Smash Bros. specifically. Now, you also have the very iconic small discs that came with the GameCube. Now, Nintendo did this to fight piracy, but one of the downsides about it was that you could not fit as much on a single disc, obviously, because it's, it's significantly smaller. Well, what happened is, is the GameCube is actually arguably the most powerful of that console generation, but the problem with how Nintendo went about the smaller disc part is you sometimes still didn't get the bigger games that made it to PS2 and the Xbox in that era. And see, I don't have any save date on Melee, and this literally would have been a thousand plus hour file, but yeah, I'll get over that. But it's one of those things where essentially this was the last iteration of a Nintendo console that actually fought on power, which is something to say in and of itself. And yeah, the nostalgia is already hitting hard with Smash Bros. Melee because the, the, the trophy system in this, collecting all of the trophies, got me extremely hooked. Getting that 100% was absolutely so much fun had different challenges for the first time under the one player mode you had event matches you had a uh, stadium where stadium you have target tests home run contests multi-man melee just some stuff that i don't know they they put focus into this game uh in a big way and i still to this day i while the mechanics you can argue maybe you like uh smash ultimate better i definitely think i do and i definitely think that it's a better game objectively overall i do think smash ultimate is quite honestly, just the best game period. At this point, this one still just has a ton of nostalgia 
and uh still have i i just lo love to hear the the soundtrack play the menu i don't know why i'm making link fight zelda but we'll go ahead and just hop into a quick match to kind of you know demonstrate a few of the differences in the mechanics um i will tell you uh, Link was my main on the original Smash Bros. And then in this Smash Bros, no different. But in this game, I used Fox quite a bit until they nerfed him. I think they nerfed him pretty bad in Brawl. Fox was arguably one of the best competitive players. And this feels very different yeah, than, uh, <laughs> as I'm kind of getting my, my butt handed to me here. It feels very different than, of course, your, uh, your current day Smash Bros. Ultimate just different in timing, but you still have a whole competitive scene for this game. So like, if that doesn't tell you, you know, how hardcore fans are about it, and the bob -omb took me out, if that doesn't tell you how hardcore fans are about it, I don't know what will, because this is one of those that to this day still holds up. To this day, you'll still see people playing in tournaments on it. And, you know, for its time, when you think about 20 years ago, this was an incredible feat. I mean, the first Smash was great. Don't get me wrong. It has absolutely nothing on melee melee was significantly superior in every way um this is one that to quickly bring up the conversation and i do think we're quite a ways out from this to be fair but if nintendo decides to do nintendo switch online with gamecube library of games which they like to remake their gamecube games so you could argue whether or not it's going to happen to begin with at all i think they absolutely uh bring back melee and they bring it with online play because imagine the kind of tournament scenarios that could take place in 2022 and beyond with having a classic like Smash Bros. Melee and then having the ability to play online. I just think it's it would be absolutely incredible and something that hopefully Nintendo will do one day. But uh, you will hop out of this game because I, there's quite a few games that I want to boot up today. At least we'll probably get to like five or so of them. So we'll pause it here on Melee and go to the next title. Now, next up on our list is none other than The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures. And I think that this is maybe one of the most unique Zelda games ever created because it's really the only one we ever saw them actually Nintendo being going for like a co-op style of gameplay you even had a traditional or true up multiplayer style of setting that you could go into in this game where you're literally playing against friends in like a brawl style beat em up uh you know it, it, four player experience and we've never seen nintendo do anything like that with the zelda game and then of course you actually have a mainline adventure that you can play either as one player or if you had friends that all had the the game boy advance and the Game Boy Advance link cable. You could link up to four different Game Boy Advances, and you could also just play single player on your GameCube, which is how I did it uh, with the GameCube controller. But it is a really cool mechanic because you kind of see the beginning of Nintendo's thought process with like the Wii U and how they tried to have two separate screens in this game. Now, uh, you also have a very other rare thing for a Zelda game is a traditional level select. Like that's almost never like a traditional overworld, almost Mario style. But you did, you did see Nintendo kind of play around with the idea of essentially, you know, uh, uh, to explain the gameplay here real quick before I get sidetracked, you can basically put your, your links all in formation. You can do one by one and control them all. Of course, if you have four players, you all get to uh, simultaneously kind of go in your own way. And then there's certain caves and things that you'll see come up that will actually uh, basically go into the handheld display. And that's where I was kind of going with, it's funny to look back now, and I didn't realize where we were at at the time when I was first playing this, but to look back and realize that Nintendo is always kind of trying to steer towards that merging the, the portable console and the home console together. And of course, now we know what that is with the Switch. Uh, this is a little tutorial here. I'll try to uh, get out of this because I don't think we really need to go through the tutorial. So I, I think they're going to force us into it. Okay, well, okay, so I got through that real quick. But basically, you can you can essentially control whichever link you want, and then you can just call them all back with the Y button if you want to. And then, of course, you just have, a, you know, some really unique puzzle designs that you don't typically see in a traditional Zelda game. And I think that this was just kind of a, a one-off experiment. And, of course, it came out around the same time as the Wind Waker, so we have, like, that Toon League-style art uh, when it comes to the Link's looks and things, but uh, I really enjoy playing through this game start to finish. It's one that, like I said, just makes a ton of sense that if we were to ever get something like the, the Nintendo GameCube games on the Nintendo Switch as part of Nintendo Switch Online, or maybe one day they bring back the virtual console service. Uh, I don't think that they will do that necessarily, but that is definitely a possibility. And if they do, it'll be interesting to see if we, they will ever bring back some of these classic gems that I think, you know, I think gamers today, especially Zelda fans, 
if you're a hardcore Zelda fan, you should definitely give this one a shot and play it. And so um, I did not get the boomerang that I think I need for that key over there, but that's okay. We're going to have to switch into another game because if I go too long in each of these, I won't have enough time to show you all of them. So let's hop into the next title together. Now you want to talk about a quality, intense, fast action, fast, super fast paced racing game that requires actually a significant amount of skill. We're talking F-Zero GX or the pinnacle of the, of the series, in my personal opinion. I just don't think it ever got any more advanced than this one. I'm going to do standard. I probably am not even up to snuff for that. We'll do the Ruby Cup and just hop in as Captain Falcon. But this, to me, is the pinnacle of F-Zero games. I definitely, I'm surprised, to be honest with you guys. I'm surprised that Nintendo is just letting Captain Falcon act like, you know, he's not existing anymore in today's day and age. I mean, it has been since, I don't know if this game came out in 2000 and, yep, 2003. So, we're you know, we're knocking on 20 years since we've had really like a mainline Captain Falcon installment in the F-Zero franchise. Like, let's go. I mean, it's time. It is, uh, I don't know if I should have done that because I'm probably going to fall off a lot. You can basically choose like if you want to accelerate faster or if you're going to get a higher max speed. I am by no means well versed in this game anymore. Once upon a time, I did make the effort to go through and get like the, the number one place in every single cup. I can't remember exactly what you get for that. It has been a long time since I played this game, but all of the memories that I have about it is just how ridiculously fast paced it is like and, and how ridiculously challenging it is and this is a different experience than what you'll find in like a mario kart type of title because it really is all just like strategic fast racing uh and you're not you're not worried about items so much you can bump into people bump into the sides and things i gotta remember how to use my boost here okay so you actually can spin around too with the z button so yeah this is this is uh I, it's making me want to play this game like all the way through again bad and then you can kind of uh so R and L are essentially like a quick, a little bit of a drift, if you will. Um, y is boost. So I, I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out. But then you'll want to, in order to boost and things, you'll want to stay in these uh, booster areas where it charges it back up. And now whenever you're boosting in this game, it really, the, the, the feel that they created as far as like how fast you feel like you're moving is top notch and next level. I don't know if this is running 60 frames per second. I would assume it is because it's, it's pretty smooth. Granted, it is uh, funny how now you can kind of see the, the pixelation effect that you used to not, not see near as much. And I believe, uh, I, I can't quite remember if, if you'd still use boost and that bar runs out completely. It may be something that your ship actually just blows up completely. So, uh, like I said, been a long time, but this is, this, this game's a ton of fun. And I can't believe that I came in first on that race, by the way, but it's, if you want to go up to the, uh, advanced difficulty and then you may unlock one after that, it's been so long. I can't remember but this is this is the game for sure for fast action racing this is the best in the series and one that i'm just so surprised that nintendo hasn't done anything else with f-zero it makes sense from a sales perspective the same way that the star fox games have been pretty dormant over the years they just don't typically sell all that well which i think is a shame and i do think that maybe it's been enough time similar to like metroid how we've seen you know long breaks in that game over the course of time but then we still get a good iteration like metroid dread and by all accounts, that game is selling very solid. It's not a blockbuster Zelda or Mario or even up to quite like what Donkey Kong would perform at. Uh, but I think that the fan base is there. And in the Switch era, they need to give these these in iterations, uh, you know, these classic series a chance to sell when you have that hundred plus million install user base. Because, you know, a hundred million versus like I think the GameCube sold in the 20 millions or something like that. That's obviously a very large discrepancy. And so this game may have somewhat flopped on the GameCube, but if you put it on something that has 100 million plus install base, or you just make a brand new one from the ground up, however they want to do it, I think it's more, more it makes more than enough sense to me. Uh, I know I'm just like an old school hardcore Nintendo fan, so maybe the masses wouldn't pick up this game. But when it comes to a racing game, I'm not typically into many of them, but I will tell you guys that outside of like Mario Kart, this is the other one that I could get severely addicted to and really try to go down the rabbit hole of getting 100% on an entire file all the way through. So we won't spend too much time here because you guys know it's F-Zero. You know what to expect. You can see how fast everything moves and kind of get a feel for, you know, how this game plays. Uh, and it's definitely, you know, a lot of strategy that goes into just making sure you hit all the boosts and get, you know, try to finish first every single race. But one for me that I definitely hope we see brought back in the future.
Now, I was going to try to stay away from any of the games that I do think we will see, like the remake or re-release around the corners of, and Metroid Prime is one that I'm absolutely hopeful that those rumors are true, that indeed this game is done and ready to go, and maybe we get it revealed at E3, and maybe even if we're super lucky, we get the Wind Waker and Twilight Princess HD brought over as well, but I couldn't not boot up the GameCube and also just briefly play through Metroid Prime. Apparently I have, okay, I didn't realize on this memory card, I have a file that's at like an hour and 46 in. So at some point I must've started playing this and then never completed it the rest of the way. But this, this to me is one of the games that I didn't expect to be a fan of. When I bought this, I think it was getting sold for like five bucks or something at my local game exchange. And I really just picked it up because it was so cheap. I had zero clue who Samus was at that time, other than I had obviously played as or in uh, Smash Bros. Melee uh, up to that point, but I had zero clue what her own, you know, franchise was all about. And when I tell you guys, I was immediately immersed in the world and what they created with Metroid Prime. I mean, I really can't tell you how many times I went back through and re-completed this game uh, to 100% completion, literally scanning. Like if you want to do a 100% run in this game, if you're not familiar, you have to legitimately scan every creature you find and get data on it. So you're walking around for like a good chunk of the game. Anything new that you see, you actually have to scan that that uh, particular object and or uh, there's lore and like different different things to basically um, complete your, your start menu section. That's the only way you get the true 100% uh, tick mark at the end of the game. And that was so much fun for me to go back and do. Unfortunately, I did learn the hard way. There are a few missable uh, creatures that like once you beat the, I think it's the boss of the ice cavern or Fedrina Drifts. I don't even know if that's how you say it, but I haven't really said that word in a long time. But in that, it basically in the ice area, if you beat that boss and, uh, and you don't scan the ice bats before you do it, well, then at that point, you've just messed up because you can now no longer uh, actually get a 100% run. And that's actually, you know, not too far into the game. It's the next area from here. Uh, but it's definitely, it's far enough that if you if you get further than that and think you're getting 100%, and then you, what, I, what happened to me is me and a buddy were playing through it together, handing the controller off back and forth, thinking that we were actually good with everything, made it way further uh, into the game, and then realized that what's that missing creature that we didn't scan. And unfortunately it was, uh, it was those ice bats that we couldn't get back. So that's a pretty scarring memory of this series for me. Um, of course, we did see this released as part of the Prime Trilogy again on the uh, Nintendo Wii. And while this is the perfect game to use motion controls in a lot of ways, I've always preferred the button control layout of Prime 1 and 2. And it actually kind of caused me to not be as big of a fan of Prime 3 Corruption because of the motion control. And to be fair, they're done really well. I was just at that point in time really and still to this day to be honest uh not really a fan of being having forced motion controls like i think that it's great and sometimes i feel like playing for a while with motion but i don't want to play uh you know a 20 30 hour game entirely based off motion controls uh which is why i love skyward sword hd coming to the uh to the switch so much because i did play with motion some of the time most of the time i was playing with a controller just because that's how i prefer to play now this game is absolutely on the top of my list that we we have to see it released before Metroid Prime 4. We know we probably still have quite a ways uh, of waiting before that game eventually comes out. It is so dark in this area that it's very hard to see right now. Uh, and, you know, so since that, since we have that waiting time, I think it's the logical thing to keep Metroid Prime fans, you know, uh, one, hyped up, uh, two, expose a whole new generation of players that didn't play this nearly 20-year-old game or, or 20-year-old game now at this point. Uh, which, by the way, graphics for 20 years ago on a Nintendo piece of hardware, I mean, it's pretty incredible to see what they created. If you just upscale this, it is absolutely next level quality. Uh, still holds up in 2022, which is kind of crazy to say, especially whenever you think of, you know, Nintendo's typical graphical performance. Uh, retro hit it out of the park with this one. And, you know, before we go too much further, I know the length, the length of the video is going to go too long if we don't stop here, but ton of nostalgia for Metroid Prime, ton of nostalgia for the GameCube games. Clearly, there's a lot of classics that we didn't even talk about today, such as Mario Sunshine, The Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, like I mentioned. I think we are getting some of those hopefully ported in the near future. But I want to hear from you guys at this point in the video what you think about the GameCube library of games. How nostalgic are they for you? What is your favorite GameCube games from this era? And do you think we will ever ultimately see them make it to something like part of Nintendo Switch Online or maybe part of some kind of future virtual console? What do you personally think Nintendo is going to do with this excellent library of games so i want to hear from you guys on all things gamecube and your nostalgic memories and what you think the future of the library has to do going forward as i do look forward to getting a back and forth conversation started with you all around this topic 
Make sure you check out Friday's video if you haven't already, where we discuss the brand new trailer that launched for Mario Strikers Battle League and a discussion around how that game may launch light and content like the other Mario sports games we've seen so far, and a quick discussion around Nintendo Switch Online being available for over seven months and one big problem that Nintendo has not addressed yet with that service. Also, make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notification bell, and I will see you guys in the next video.